Hey everybody, Mr. Marek, in our like 90th installment of thermodynamics video lessons. In this lesson, we are learning about the second law of thermodynamics, which is only simultaneously one of the most important laws in the universe and one of the most confusing laws in the universe. And one of the reasons why it's confusing is because it can be expressed in so many different ways and it can be derived from so many different paths. Um, and so you can find a lot of information out there about this law. Um, but at its basis, it's a law that tells us what things can happen spontaneously. Like what things happen on their own or what things happen without input of work. So that's the basic idea behind this thermodynamic law. So why do we need this law? Let's consider a real simple example. Let's suppose you take a billiard ball and you drop it on the floor. So there's a floor, there's your billiard ball. Now this billiard ball has 50 joules of potential energy. As we drop it, it gains 50 joules of kinetic energy. We know this from last year because we know energy is conserved. Now when it strikes the ground and stops, comes to rest, all that energy goes into internal energy. So the ball, once it comes to rest, has gained 50 joules of internal energy, meaning it got hotter. And remember, internal energy is related to temperature. So the ball may have started out at, at um, 320 Kelvin. It may have ended up at 321 Kelvin. Now, this is a process that will happen by itself. You do not have to do any work in order to turn that potential energy into kinetic energy and then from kinetic energy to internal energy. That's a process that happens spontaneously. So here's the question. Is the reverse process spontaneous? In other words, if we run this picture backwards, does it happen without work? In other words, can we take a ball at rest and spontaneously have it pop up and gain a bunch of kinetic energy while simultaneously cooling off and losing 50 joules of internal energy? In other words, does that happen spontaneously? Um, and the answer is pretty much no. You've never observed something spontaneously moving and then getting colder at the same time. It just doesn't happen. Um, so we never see things spontaneously start moving and cool down. Now the thing is, that does not violate the law of conservation of energy. Conservation of energy says that that should be able to happen. Energy is still being conserved even though it's impossible. So what that tells us is that we need another law. We need another way of describing what's happening. So this process is possible according to the law of conservation of energy, but it doesn't actually happen in real life. So we need another law. So let's talk briefly about the quality of energy. Like how useful are these different kinds of energy? Well, if we consider the kinetic energy of a billiard ball that's falling, the kinetic energy of the billiard ball is due to all of its particles moving in the same direction. In other words, all the particles in the ball are moving downward with the same velocity. So if we took the bigger microscopic picture, like we zoomed in on the billiard ball and we could see its molecules, the particles that make it up, they're all moving downward. And so the fact that they're all moving in the same direction, they're all moving down, tells us that it is an ordered system. There's only one possible thing happening to all those particles, and that is moving downward. Now, when it's just sitting there getting a little bit warmer, when it has internal energy, Remember that internal energy is due to the kinetic energy of those particles which are moving in random directions. Keyword is random. So if we look at that microscopic picture, it looks more like that. They're moving in different directions and different speeds, 
particles are moving randomly. So random motion is disordered motion. So the first picture, the kinetic energy, they're all going the same way. We say that they are ordered. In the bottom picture, the um, internal energy is due to disordered motion. Now here's the big picture. Ordered energy will naturally go to disordered energy. And so what happens naturally is that red arrow pointing to the right. Ordered energy like kinetic energy will naturally go to disordered energy, but the reverse is not true. Disordered energy does not naturally go to ordered energy. In other words, we will never see these particles randomly arrange themselves so that they are all going the same direction. However, we could naturally see these particles, which were going the same direction, naturally all start going different directions. And so it is natural to go from ordered energy to disordered energy. The question is, well, why not? In order to answer that question, we need to do a little bit of investigation on probability and chance. In order for us to go from disordered to ordered energy, all of the particles would spontaneously, meaning on their own, start to move in the same direction. Now we're not going to go through the statistical proof of that, um, but the statistical probability of that happening is so small that it is effectively zero. In other words, the chances of that actually happening on its own statistically are so small that it's impossible. To kind of give you an example, imagine that you took a handful of straws and you just tossed them straight up into the air. How are they going to end up landing on the ground? Well, one possibility is that they land ordered, like in a nice little row. The other possibility is that they land kind of all jumbled together, pointing different directions, scattered out. So the question is, which one's more likely? And the one on the right is the more likely outcome. The reason that that's the more likely outcome, in the picture on the left, every straw has the same state, pointing up and down, Whereas in the picture on the right, every straw has a different state. The probability of a bunch of things all ending up exactly the like is very, very small. So if you took a dozen straws and you tossed them up in the air and let them fall, you could probably live a thousand years and never have them land just like that. Statistically, the odds of that happening are zero. So the, th the same thing is true about particles in motion and their energy. And the big idea we use to describe um, this concept of disorder being favored is referred to as entropy. Entropy is a measure of disorder or randomness in a system. Disorder, randomness, meaning um, more states are possible. So to kind of draw a little chart, I'm going to put some high entropy examples on the left side and put some low entropy examples on the right side. The kinetic energy of a moving ball is an example of highly ordered energy. The internal energy of a ball that hit the ground and got hot is an example of low entropy. Ordered straws, high entropy. Disordered straws, low entropy. A cold object typically has high entropy. A hot object typically has low entropy. And so one of the questions you're going to be asked next time is why is that true? Why does a cold object have more order than a warm object? So the new law, and since we already have one law of thermodynamics, this is typically called the second law of thermodynamics, is that in any spontaneous process for an isolated system, the entropy of the system is going to increase. 
So spontaneous processes in an isolated system increase the entropy of that system. So here's a simple example. We've got two objects of different temperature, and we put them inside some sort of insulated container. Now spontaneously, they will transfer heat until they reach equilibrium. When that happens, the system has become more disordered. The reason we know it's become more disordered is because this happens spontaneously, whereas the reverse does not happen spontaneously. So basically, we'll never see two objects of the same temperature randomly, one get colder and one get hotter. That never happens. The reason that it never happens is because the entropy of this is greater than the entropy of the starting objects together. Let's look at another example in a more general statement. More generally, we can say that the um, things that happen naturally to an open system, so spontaneous processes in an open system, will increase the entropy of the system itself, or it will increase the surroundings entropy. Or sometimes it could be both. We could have and in there as well. So in other words, you can decrease the entropy of a system, but the entropy of the surroundings has to increase in order for that to happen. Thing is that that increase is going to be greater than the decrease in entropy that you had of your system. So if I want to decrease the entropy of something, I can, but I've got to increase the entropy somewhere else. So let's take, for example, our ball. We can give that ball useful kinetic energy, but in order to do that, we have to have something doing work on it. So here's a kid that's kicking the ball. In order to kick the ball, he's doing work on it. But as a result of that, the entropy of the kid has to increase. There's a couple of different ways that would be um, seen. Number one, he may get hotter. You do work, you get hotter. Um, on a more microscopic level, he's taking complex molecules like sugar, which have low entropy, and he's breaking them up into carbon dioxide and water. So he's going to breathe out more carbon dioxide and water, which has a higher entropy than the sugar that he started with. We're going to investigate that idea a little bit farther in class, how this applies to chemistry and bi biological systems. So the big idea here is that the kinetic energy of this can only increase if somebody does work on it, or something does work on it. So there are three consequences of the second law of thermodynamics we need to understand. The first is that heat naturally flows from hot to cold. Going backwards would cause a decrease in entropy, which does not happen on its own. The second is that no heat engine can be 100% efficient. In reality, the second law of thermodynamics limits it even more than just saying it can't be 100% efficient. For example, thermodynamics says your car engine is never going to be more efficient than about 33%. If I remember correctly. That's a fundamental law of nature. That's what the, the second law of thermodynamics tells us. And then the third consequence is that energy goes to thermal energy over time. In other words, energy degrades over time. So to kind of go back to this idea of the quality of energy, when entropy increases, that means that there's less useful energy with which you can do work. This also means that in any exchange of energy, useful energy gets degraded to internal energy. In other words, things get hotter. That's always going to be true. And then if we take that idea all the way, basically we can kind of think a little bit um, and come to the conclusion that if all of our energy is getting wasted, if it's all going to useless energy, eventually there's not going to be any useful energy left in the universe. 
Um, so essentially we're all doomed and the universe is eventually going to end with no more useful energy and then we're, we're all doomed. Um, and so that's kind of the, um, I guess, the depressing end of this. Um, well, I guess the key thing here is just to, to, to make the best of it while we still can um, and not worry too much about the fact that the universe is eventually going to wear out. Um, and we can just think happy thoughts instead of worrying so much about that. But what we do need to know is why the second law is important, what it tells us. And then we need to be able to explain what things will happen spontaneously and what things require work to be done. Those are the two things we really need to know. And we'll worry about the um, whole universe ending thing a little bit later. And so until then, um, sorry that ended kind of depressingly, um, but think happy thoughts, and I'll see y'all in class. Goodbye.